33. Sorry? 33. 33. By and by we'll see the change. By and by we'll see the change. <laughs>
like to have our brother David Wilson, David Simpson with us tonight uh, to sing to us. He's going to sing two pieces now, and then we'll later on. Thank you for coming, David, and the Lord bless you as your ministry. to bring before you is a piece called Unworthy of the Blood. Now I sang it here I think a couple of times before. So if you know the chorus, you can have to sing it to do that. Right, okay. <laughs> Precious blood has made me whiter than 
the virgin snow. Everybody say it. Here am I, so unworthy of the blood, unworthy of the blood that said. such love for me, but this I know, he paid it all upon that cruel tree. Here am I, so unworthy of the blood, unworthy of the blood that set me free. Here am I, so unworthy of the blood. the first night of our seventh annual mission. Thank you for coming. I see people from near and far, and the Lord bless you, and I trust that you'll enjoy the meeting, and you have been enjoying it, I'm sure. We're going to sing again hymn number 81, Down at the Cross, where my Saviour died, Down where for cleansing from sin I died, There to my heart was the blood of thy, Glory to his name. Here we want things.
Our scripture reading for this evening is in the Old Testament, and it's a little book near the end of your Old Testament, about the fourth book in from Malachi. Now, if you'll find the end of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi, come back from Malachi into Zechariah, back from Zechariah to Haggai, and then the next book in is the book of Zephaniah. It's as clear as mud, isn't it? Now, I hope you can find it. While you're looking for it, may I thank Bertie for his welcome. It's a great joy to be here. I've got to know so many folk around this district, and I hope that you support us during the mission, and that you'll do your best to get as often as you can. You know I'm a great believer in divine healing, and tomorrow night we'll be thinking a little about that. And if you have need of prayer or know anyone that may need prayer, do please ask them to come along and we'll have something to say to them and we'll pray for them after the service. Now, have you found the little book of Zephaniah? We're reading in chapter 3 and for the sake of time, we're just reading the first five verses. Zephaniah, please, chapter 3, reading the first five verses. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted, to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, she drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He feeleth not. But the unjust knoweth no shame. Ending there, we know God's blessing will attend this reading from the book. Now, on this opening night of mission, I thought I would do something different. I brought my sermon along in a bag this evening, as well as in my Bible, because I want you to see the sermon as well as listen to it. Now, if you nosy people, you'll want to see what's in my back. <laughs> it's just a piece of rope. And you'll see that there are four knots on it. <coughs> and that is my sermon for this evening. Four knots on the rope that binds the damned and the deluded soul. <coughs> now will I show you the sermon in the Bible? Look at Zephaniah chapter 3 and look at verse 2. You will see of course the knots are spelled differently. Now look what the Bible says. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. My dear unconverted soul in this meeting, could I speak as a minister to you in love? Those are the four knots that will destroy and damn you. If you obey not God's voice, if you receive not God's correction, if you trust not in the Lord, and if you draw not near to your God, those will be the four knots that will destroy and damn your soul. Now, if you look at this chapter in Zephaniah, 
you will see that those words were spoken first and foremost about Jerusalem and the people that dwelt in Jerusalem. And friends, if ever people heard God's voice, if ever people were corrected by the Lord, if ever people had privileges and people had light and people had heard preaching, I tell you it was the people of Jerusalem. You see, Jerusalem was the city of the great king. Do you know that the great prophet Isaiah worked and witnessed in the city of Jerusalem? And through the great prophet Isaiah, I almost 800 years before Jesus came, the people of Jerusalem heard exactly how Jesus would be born and what he would be called. <coughs> Go to Isaiah chapter 7, read verse 14. <coughs> Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Imagine hearing that from God 800 years before Jesus ever came. Boy, they had that privilege. Go to Isaiah chapter 9, read verse 6. <coughs> Unto us a child is born. <coughs> Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Imagine almost 800 years before Jesus ever came, the people of Jerusalem heard God saying that to them. But Isaiah not only told the people of Jerusalem how Jesus would be born, the great Isaiah very graphically depicted why Jesus would die. Isaiah 53, 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All the people of Jerusalem heard the voice of God, friends, for Isaiah worked in witness there. But not only did Isaiah work and witness there, do you know the great prophet Jeremiah, he wept and he kneeled there? Go to Jeremiah chapter 9, read verse 1. Jeremiah cried out, Oh, that my head were waters, that mine eyes were a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people, for your harvest is past, and your summer is ended, and you are not saved. Boy, if ever people had light, if ever people had privileges, if ever people heard the voice of God, I tell you the people of Jerusalem heard it. <coughs> not only did Isaiah work and witness there, not only did Jeremiah weep and wail there, do you know all the prophets, I, all the prophets warned Jerusalem, and their warnings came to a head when the prophet Amos came. When you go home tonight, read Amos chapter 4 and see how God corrected the people of Jerusalem. Five times God tried to correct the people of Jerusalem by withholding the rain from them, by withholding the harvest from them, by sending war, by saving them from sudden death. And five times in Amos chapter 4, God has to say, yet... Yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And in spite of all the warnings, and in spite of all the witness, and in spite of the way God preached to the people of Jerusalem, he had to write, they obey not the voice. <clears throat> They received not correction. They trusted not in the Lord. They drew not near to their God. And here's the amazing thing. 
in spite of the way God spoke to the people of Jerusalem, in spite of the fact that Jesus was foretold 800 years before he ever came, when the Savior finally did come, wouldn't you have thought that those people that have been prepared for his coming, wouldn't you have thought they would have greeted him with open arms? But read your Bibles. Read John 1 verse 10. It says, Jesus was in the world, and the world was made by him, <coughs> and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, the Jewish people that he had prepared for years, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. And heartbroken at the end of his ministry, Christ had to go outside the city of Jerusalem. And when he saw the city, he cried out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. <coughs> They obeyed not the voice, and that was the thing that damned the Jews. <coughs> Let's forget about Israel. What about Ireland? Let's forget about Jerusalem. What about Dungan? Have we not had as many privileges and as many opportunities and have we not had as many chances to hear the voice of God as the people of Jerusalem did? I see a lot of children in this meeting today. You know, God began with you early like he did with Samuel. You remember whenever you were just a child. <coughs> And your father and your mother sent you out to hear godly Sunday school teachers. And those godly Sunday school teachers made sure that you heard the voice of God. They told you there was a heaven to be and there was a hell to shun. Do you remember how those Sunday school teachers taught you that Jesus was the bread of life? Ah, oh, but you never fed thereon. Those Sunday school teachers told you that Jesus was the only way to heaven. Ah, oh, but you never walked therein. Those Sunday school teachers taught you hymns like there is a fountain filled with blood. Oh, but you never watched therein. And isn't it strange, even as a child, we don't want Jesus. In spite of the fact that God says, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. We heard his voice <coughs> teaching his children. <coughs> And we heard his voice in preaching as teenagers. You know, I'm looking over this meeting tonight. Some of you are like myself. <coughs> you wouldn't tear the puck in my hand. <laughs> the hair is getting grey. And the form is getting stiff. But you remember whenever we were teenagers. No big car at the door then to whisk you away to some disco or dance. <coughs> There was no wee box sitting in the corner, a wee goggle box to keep you in at night. Do you remember when you were a teenager and a mission came to your district? It was somewhere to go. And you went along maybe to pass the night to a gospel mission. What preachers you heard. <coughs> preachers that would have brought a tear to the eye of a stone. Some of you have listened to godly faith mission pilgrims. Some of you are old enough like myself to have heard W.P. Nichols. But even as a teenager, you didn't want Jesus. And you didn't want to listen to Jesus. And you said, go for it. Go thy way. Some more convenient day of the I call. And the years go on, you don't attend as many gospel missions now. But God still makes sure you hear his voice. A friend dies. Out of respect, you go along to the funeral. And at that funeral, a minister preaches, Be ye also loved. <coughs> for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man may come for you. Men and women, 
It's a great privilege to hear the voice of God. <coughs> there are some countries have no Bible. There are millions of people who have never been inside a church or a mission hall. And we are a privileged people. There are more churches in the north of Ireland than anywhere else on earth. There are more gospel missions held than any other place. I'm amazed that every year you have a mission here. It's a very serious thing to refuse God's voice. Because Proverbs chapter 1 verse 26 says, and this is God's speaking. God says, because I have called and ye have refused. I have stretched out my hand, but no man regarded. Ye have set up not all my counsel. Ye would none of my reproof. God says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. For then shall ye call, but I will not answer. Have you ever seen a man lying in his deathbed calling and God never answered? I have. I spoke to a man for years about his soul and he used to laugh at me and he said, How did it take me death bed, Sammy? It came to his death bed. And I visited that man and fear was looking out of his eyes. And he said, Sammy, there's nobody there. Every night for God to have mercy on me, but my prayer goes to hell in the ceiling. No, you see, you can't pray fast in the spirit of God, friend. <coughs> because I have called and you have refused, God says, I will laugh at your calamity, I will mock when your fear come, for then shall he call and I will not answer. Friends, could I say this, and I hope I say it lovingly. You can't treat God like a waiter in a chip shop. You're just the subject. He's the sovereign. When Queen Elizabeth says, come to the palace, that's not just an invitation, that's a command. <laughs> and you can't put God to the end of the queue. And say, look, Lord, I have too many irons in the fire at the minute. <coughs> you see, friends, if God ever comes you, please, please listen to me tonight. If God ever calls you, come when he calls. Because if you obey not the voice, <coughs> that will be the knock of down you. The knock of disobedience. She obeyed not the voice. Very quickly. <coughs> she received not correction. <coughs> now let me tell you a very solemn truth. <coughs> when people refuse to hearken to the call of God, the time comes whenever they hearken <coughs> to the correction of God. You farmer, did you ever see an old horse that starts to rebel at the reins? <coughs> Ten comes and kicks at the foot. <coughs> and let me say this, God's not a fiend. God's a father. <coughs> and you fathers, let me ask you something. Why do you correct your children? Why do you punish your children? Why do you warn your children? Because you're an old spoiled sport and an old funny duddy and you don't like to see them enjoying themselves. Is that why you correct your children? No, Father, you correct your children because you love them. And that because it would break your heart to see them going the wrong road and finishing up in the wrong place. And God loves you more than any father. And that's why Hebrews says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chastens and corrects. You see, aren't we funny creatures? When everything's going all right, we've got good jobs and the money's coming in, we've got our health, we spend, we don't bother with God. 
But isn't it amazing, friends, when we're sick or when we're in trouble? And that's the time we want to pray. And you see, that's why your Heavenly Father corrects you, friends. Sometimes you say, what's God doing this to me for? Because God's your Father. And because God sees it's the only way to get through to you. You know Marilyn, don't you? Do you know the rector down in Marilyn, Canon Roland Hutchison, an old man, done many missions for him. <clears throat> the last mission I had for Canon Hutchison, Luna and I were invited to the rectory for supper. And he told me a story that, well, it grieved my heart to hear it. <clears throat> he said, you know, Sam, we had a man in this parish was sent to church, was sent to Sunday school. When he got into his teens, like many another, he just talked about church and God and everything else. Very well to do. But he drank a lot. Stopped coming to church altogether. But he said, Sam, two years ago, to my surprise, that man sent for me. And he says, I went along to his beautiful farmhouse. I was shown up into the bedroom, and there was his wife and his children and friends had gathered. The man, through excessive drinking, had taken take sclerosis of the liver. The doctor held no hope for him. And he looked up from that deathbed, I thought, and he said, Oh, Rector, I want you to talk to him about getting right with God. Now, I know I haven't bothered about him, but Rector, look... <laughs> I'm going to meet my maker so that I want to know how to be ready. Could you tell me how to prepare? <coughs> and he says, I took out my Bible and in front of that man's wife and family and friends, I showed him that Christ had died for his sins and that the Lord would in no wise pass him out if he would come. And in front of everybody lying in that bed, he says, I want to come, Rector. And he lifted his heart and he said, Oh God, I'm a sinful man of mercy on me, and I'll be different. Lord, please save me, and Lord, touch me. And Canon Hutchison told me, Sammy, I went home and I was delighted to think that this man had sought the Lord in his death, and that had been corrected through this disease, through excessive drinking. He said, I'll tell you what I did. The next morning, he says, I prepared a sermon to preach at his funeral service for I thought to myself he's not long for this world and whenever that man dies the public is going to be there his drinking cronies are going to be there and all the district's going to be there and it'll be an opportunity and he says I've prepared this sermon and he says every day I waited for a week to send me word that he had gone but he says wonder after wonder he says three weeks passed and I heard the man at the bed and I says Rector, I suppose he's at the church every Sunday. Not about it. He said, you know the first place he went when he got up? Down to the pub, he says. And I met that man on Lorgan Street. And I said to him, Here, I thought you made a vow to God that you'd be a different man if he raised you up. I haven't seen you at church yet. He says he laughed at me. And when he was walking away, he turned to I don't think I've seen many of them whenever you're in trouble, he says. Oh, men and women, that would be the lot that will down that poor man. He received not correction. And listen, Lord, if ever you're in trouble and you pray and make vows, let me tell you what the Bible says. When thou vowest a vow to the Almighty, Defer not to pay it. If ever you're in trouble and you pray and God helps you, let me warn you. Receive correction. Learn. Learn a lesson. Because that will be the knot that will damn a lot of people. She received not correction. Very quickly. She trusted not in the Lord. Supposing I could take you aside tonight 
and when the two of us were on our own, suppose that I asked you a question. <coughs> what are you depending on to get to heaven? I wonder, love, what answer you would give me. What answer, sir, would you give me? Would you say, well, now you listen, Sam, I'm not a bad woman. Well, I don't go to church as often as I should, but I'm not a bad woman. I'm a good mother, and I look after my family, and I try to do my best, and I help as many people as I can. And I've always given me good causes. And I don't think God has sent me to get in other words, love, well, you're trusting in yourself and how nice you are and how good you are. Not trusting the Lord, are you? Not seeing. Oh, I hate that word, seeing. I hate that word. No, you're just <coughs> trusting in yourself, how nice you are and how good you are. I've been in the ministry over 40 years. One of the great blessings I have had as an evangelist, I preach in all denominations. I preach to the select vestry in the Church of Ireland. Just last week I was preaching to the South Tyrone Elders Fellowship in the Presbyterian Church. I go along to the Methodist and I preach to the leaders' boards. I go to Baptist and Congregational Churches and I preach to the dead that there. And thank God, amongst those leaders, I have found many good godly men that are trusting in the Lord. But I'm sorry to have to say, among those leaders, I have also found men, and if you speak to them about getting saved, it's like shaking a red rag in a bowl. If you talk to them about being born again, my night. You can talk to them and be and see if they're born again. And the leaders in the church. Don't they take the communion? Don't they pay in? They're not trusting in the Lord. You know, in my last church, I wasn't three weeks installed. When the leaders of the church said, now Mr. Rotten, you'll have to visit Mrs. So-and-so. She's a pillar in this church. You don't know what that woman has done for this place. So I went along to see this woman I was told was a pillar in the church. Now friends, she was as nice a woman as walked in shoe leather. Invited me in, made me a lovely tea. <coughs> and sitting at the tea, she talked about how often she took communion. <coughs> she told me how she taught in the Sunday school and sang in the choir and how she had lifted up money for missionaries and when the church was in debt, how she had got many of her friends to give donations. But she never once mentioned the Lord. And I got rather annoyed and finally I said to this dear lady, Tell me this, my dear, are you a Christian? And her answer was anything but Christian. Man, she clenched her fist and she danced in her toes and the veil stood up in her neck and she said, Am I a Christian? Am I a Christian? What do you think I am, your reverence? A heathen? Am I a Christian? Don't I come to your church twice on a Sunday? Don't I sing in your choir and teach in your Sunday school? Haven't I given one? Am I a Christian? What do you think I am? I said, I love, 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 love. You'll be giving yourself a heart attack. <laughs> well, I was born a Christian. But I says, love, it's a sure sign you don't know your Bible if you tell me you were born a Christian. Because the Bible says in Psalm 51, verse 6, In sin did my mother conceive me. And it says in Ephesians chapter 3, By nature, by birth, we are all the children of God. You weren't born a Christian. Well, I was not paid a Christian. But I says, now, love, do you mean to say sprinkling a wee drop of water and a child to make that child a Christian? <laughs> Every IRA man was probably baptized. <laughs> Yet it's amazing the number of you people in this meeting today. And if I could take you aside, you would say exactly the same thing about the Holy Church. I take my communion. I pay in against my worship. Friends, what does your old hymn say? Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply. 
has crossed my king. God would have been an awful fool to send Jesus to die for you. <coughs> if you could get into heaven by simply going to church and taking communion and live a good life. Friends, there's only one way to be saved, and that's trusting in the Lord. <coughs> no matter what you're trusting or who you're trusting, if you're not trusting in the Lord, that will be the knot that will damn you. Now the children have been very good. I better finish. <coughs> the last night, she drew not near to her God. Do you know it's amazing the things people have turned to? But they never turn to the Lord. They draw nearly this, that, and the other thing. You remember in that picture of Jesus over Jerusalem, he pictured the chicken and the hens. You see, there's the wee chicks. They see a hawk in the sky or some other imminent danger. And when the danger's there, the mother hen gives a cry. And what do the wee chickens do? What do they do when they see the danger? They rush to the shelter and safety of our wings. God wants you to do that tonight. But tell me, father and mother, what would you think of a child when its wee heart was breaking? Or when that wee child was in some terrible trouble, what would you think of that wee child? If it ran out into the streets, if it ran away to some stranger, Never look to you for the comfort and help that you would get. Sure, it would break your heart. And how do you think God feels as He sees you going through a world fraught with danger and distress? That when trouble comes, you're on the other side of the other, and you're on the end. That's not the reason. People will even turn to the occult and turn to fortune telling. Let me finish. <coughs> Some of you can remember, you remember down at Port Stewart? I used to be, I could not afford to go on a, 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 a holiday away to these exotic places when I was a young minister down there at Danaki. But when I was down at Danaki, you and I like to go to Port Stewart. And in my days, way back there in the 50s, you see, when you were over the convent on the approach to you come down the steps, there was a wee tent where there was a fortune teller, and there was a row of seats, and all these old years were sitting along these seats at night. And one night when I was doing a bit of shopping, and I came over the steps, and there's all these old dears sitting along. So uh, I must have been the devil in me, you know. I went over and I sat down beside him, you know, and one old dear said, She's very good, you know. I says, Who's very good? The fortune teller. I says, Is that right? Oh, she knows the future. I gave her ten pounds. I said, You what? <laughs> I gave her ten pounds. Oh, she can tell the future. And by this time, all the other old years, you know, they were listening, you know. And uh, I said very casually, uh, uh, you know, I can tell the future too. You can't not. You talk about moths scattering round the light, all the old years. Oh, go on, do it. I says, I can tell the future. I says, you might not like it, you know. I'll go on, do it. I says, I'll tell you something. <laughs> that old blade in there, you know, that, that old blade can't tell you the future. That's only a charlatan in there. But I can really tell the future. I'll go on, do it. I says, well, you're not like it now. I'll go on, do it, do it. Well, I says, I'll tell you the future. You see, Jesus wrote the book of the Revelation. What for? To show us things that must shortly come to pass. And I says, Jesus also in the book of Luke chapter 13, he told the future. He likened the end of the world to the master of a great house that built and shut the door. And when the door was shut, these people come up and knock. Lord, Lord, open up us! I don't know you! <coughs> Lord, you don't know us! Why, Lord, we've eaten and drunk in my presence. You've taught, Lord, in our street. Notice the language these people used. They weren't here. <coughs> Call him Lord. 
They told the Lord they'd taken communion, they'd eaten and drunk in his presence. They had the privilege of open air meetings, they taught in our streets. I know you not. And the door of grace was shut. And I says, ladies, that's the future. If you ladies don't know Christ as your Savior, one day the door of grace is going to be shut. It won't matter if you take the communion. It won't matter if you can call the Lord if you've got the language. It won't matter if you've had the privilege to be brought up in a Christian country. If you don't know him, because this is life eternal, that they might know thee. And I says, that's the future, yes. Yes. Oh, you belong to the brethren, huh? I says, I don't belong to the brethren. <laughs> I'm an ordained minister. I'm just telling you the truth. Friends, I'm telling you the truth tonight. Those are the four knots in the rope that can calm your soul. If you obey not God's voice, and you've heard it tonight again. If you receive not God's correction, and He has been speaking to some of you correctly. If you trust not in the Lord, and if you draw not near to your God, then He's drawn near to you. Because the consolation of this verse is this if you draw an eye to God, God will draw an eye to you. He is a father. He's not a king. <coughs> because he's a father, he loves you. And he has given his son to die for you. And he makes you the promised backslider tonight. He says he's married to you. And he'll heal your backsliding and he'll love you freely and his anger will be turned away and he'll go on to your throat. And if you're not a Christian tonight, he promises and he'll come to them. And he'll always cast you out. Now tell him what you're going to do. Bertie can't decide for you, I can't decide for you. The wife sitting next to you can't decide for you. Your mother and father can't. But you can decide for yourself what you're going to do. <coughs> and let's have a little prayer together. And do pray for yourself. You're a backslider here tonight. Here's how you can pray. <coughs> Lord, I want to start this new year in the right heart. You know how I lived last year. And the mess of it. But just as you restored Peter, and just as you forgave David, you can restore to me the joy of your salvation. Pray that, friend. Pray that, backslider. And if you're not saved, here's how you can pray. <coughs> and you can pray this after me, but you have to mean it. Lord, <coughs> I've heard you speaking to me many times. And I've always known I needed to be saved. <coughs> But I've never come before. But sitting in this meeting tonight, I'm coming now. And I believe you're not cast me out. <coughs> I thank you, Lord, you'll help me to repent. And you will help me, Lord, with my problems and habits. And I accept you now. Now, if you prayed that and meant it, I'm going down to the door. I want you to tell me something. If you'd like a wee chat with me, there's two rooms down at the back, one on your right, one on your left. Just say, Sammy, I'm slipping in here. 
and I come in and talk to you pretty much. Now, Father, confirm your word. The signs following the preacher. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, two verses of the hymn 140. I hear a welcome voice that calls me Lord. Just two verses of this great old hymn. First and second verse, we stand by the reason. Thank you for watching this video. Feel free to like this video and subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with new videos as they come online.